Hey y'all, it's Ryan. Hey y'all, it's Ryan, and today I'll be talking about a new first author paper of mine published in Psychological Science. We focused on one of the very first questions I wanted to answer when I started my PhD. Does grief symptom severity impact our immune response to stress? And the short answer, based on our findings, is yes. We found the bereaved spouses experiencing high grief symptoms had a 19% larger increase in inflammation in the two hours following an acute stressor compared to bereaved spouses experiencing low grief symptoms. In this short video, I'll discuss our findings and take you through our experimental methods. We'll also get to hear from my PhD advisor, Dr. Chris Fagundes, on the history of how psychologists got interested in stress, impacting immune cells specifically, and why we're focused on grief here. All right, let's dive in. Did you know that when one spouse dies, the surviving spouse is at an increased risk of dying in the following year? This is called the widowhood effect, and the paper that I'm talking about today is one of many papers that comes from Project Heart, which is an NIH-funded study led by Dr. Chris Fagundes, where we investigate the biological mechanisms that may explain the greater cardiovascular disease risk over the first year after the death of one's spouse. In past studies, we've shown that bereaved spouses have higher inflammation than matched controls. We've also demonstrated that among bereaved spouses, those who report experience more severe grief symptoms also have higher inflammation than bereaved spouses reporting less severe grief symptoms. So in this paper, we extended this question to examine whether grief symptom severity predicts inflammation in response to an acute stressor in the lab. To answer this question, we recruited 111 participants who were about 68 years old on average and whose spouse had died about four months before that visit. Our bereaved spouses arrived for this visit around 7.30 and 8 a.m. and we inserted a catheter into their arm so that we could draw the blood multiple times but only poke them once. So early in the morning they had a baseline blood draw before we administered the Trier social stress test. And I'll tell you more about this standardized lab stressor in just a second. Then we drew their blood again 45 minutes and two hours after the stressor while they were again relaxing. Let's hear from Dr. Fagundes now about the history of this kind of research. Our idea for this study really comes from a, a larger literature that dates back decades showing that psychological stressors and depression can actually impact immune cells in ways that contribute to disease. In the early 2000s, we were learning more and more as a field about the idea that when people are chronically stressed or depressed, immune cells become sensitized or primed to secrete more inflammation in response to acute stressors in our daily lives, which may be one of many explanations of why stress actually can impact disease processes. So really interesting work in this direction. And it was probably adaptive at one time because you can imagine if you're experiencing an acute stressor and you're in the wild where there's lions and tigers and bears chasing after you, your body needs to prepare for wound healing by releasing those cytokines onto the periphery. Now, in mid 2000s, we found ways to test um, these kind of um, hypotheses in humans, showing that if you put a catheter in people's arms and they experience some type of acute stressor, sure enough, their inflammation levels rise and they rise higher if they are experiencing um, some type of depression. We used an experimental stress test called the Trier Social Stress Test, which, which I'll just call the stress test for the rest of this video. And we used it because it reliably prompts an increase in inflammation, but not everyone experiences the same increase following the stressor. So we can more closely look at who has a more pronounced acute inflammatory response in the lab. In the stress test, a research assistant told the participant that they had five minutes to prepare a speech for a job interview, provided them with a piece of paper where they could make notes, and told them that they would be recorded for later behavioral coding. Then they entered a room with two unknown people. Neither would smile or give anything positive interpersonally. One of the people in that room said, please begin. 
and the bereaved participant gave their five minute talk. If they stopped, one of the people wearing lab coats waited for an awkward silence for about 20 seconds before saying, you still have time. And after this, the people in lab coats instructed them to now complete a mental arithmetic task where we wanted them to count backwards from 2023 in steps of 17 for five minutes. And if slash when the participant made a mistake, one of the people in lab coats said, error, please start back at 2023. Okay, so this sounds pretty stressful, right? Participants are giving a speech and doing difficult mental math while on camera with strangers in lab coats who are being cold towards them. And after this, we had them relax by watching a documentary and then we drew their blood 45 minutes and two hours later to evaluate the response to that stressor. After the last blood draw, participants were debriefed and we told them that they were not actually being recorded and that those people in lab coats were instructed not to smile or be nice, so it wasn't anything about the participant eliciting that response. After they were debriefed from the stress test, they completed questionnaires asking about grief symptoms and depressive symptoms, among other questionnaires. We assessed grief symptoms using the Inventory of Complicated Grief, which asks 19 questions about various uh, grief symptoms. So for example, a couple of the questions were, I feel dazed or stunned over what happened, and I feel lonely a great deal of time since he or she died. We know both in animals and in humans that loss itself, especially when it's an interpersonal loss, it has unique effects that are very powerful on the body. So we wanted to see, does grief, which, you know, is really a representative of this, um, this construct really suffering the loss of someone, if that has a unique and powerful effect on the inflammatory stress response. And sure enough, it did, even accounting for people's levels of depression. So now I'll show you what we found. But first, let me tell you what the graphs you're about to see will look like. On the y-axis, we have the level of inflammation, and specifically, we're looking at interleukin-6. And on the x-axis, we have the time since the stress test in minutes. So the far left of the x-axis represents the baseline blood draw right before the stress test. And the far right of the x-axis represents two hours after the stress test. And when I show you the results, there will be two lines representing each group. The solid line is the low grief group, and the dotted line is the high grief group. And what we'll be paying attention to here is the slope, or the rate of change in IL-6 after the stress test for each uh, specific group. When we just look at the time since the stress test, grief symptom severity and inflammation, and not any other factors, we did see that grief severity did predict a greater rise in serum IL-6, which is the specific pro-inflammatory cytokine that we were studying in the next two hours after that stress test. Next, we wanted to know whether this finding was robust or just strong enough to hold after controlling for lots of important covariates, so other factors like age, gender, years of education, body mass index, comorbidities, physical activity, and depressive symptoms, as well as the days since the loss of their spouse and the time since the TSST had started or the stress test had started. After controlling for these other factors that may affect inflammation, there was still a significant difference in the rise in IL-6 based on one's reported grief severity. So here, bereaved spouses who reported more severe grief symptoms had a 19% larger increase in serum levels of the pro-inflammatory cytokine interleukin-6 in the two hours following this acute stressor compared to those who reported less severe grief symptoms. And it's important that this effect was above and beyond the influence of depressive symptoms, which emphasizes that grief has components that are different from just depression. So for example, being preoccupied with the person who passed away or not accepting their death. And we really care that grief severity was associated with the rise in interleukin-6 because interleukin-6 is an important mediator and is causally related to developing atherosclerosis. So that's where plaques build up inside our arteries. And taken together, because inflammation, and especially IL-6, interleukin-6, is a central immunological mechanism that's involved in both the onset and progression of a lot of age-related diseases, including cardiovascular disease-related events, more severe grief symptoms may be one key factor that underlies this increased risk for morbidity and mortality following the death of a spouse. And if you want to know more about 
you know, just different ways of measuring inflammation, then I'm going to put a link above um, to a video that I made previously all about inflammation and sort of how we measure it in the lab. And of course, this is still just one study, so all of the usual limitations apply, and we would absolutely love to see more research funded that can replicate and or extend these findings in different contexts and samples. So to wrap up, we found that people grieving more severely at four months after the death of their spouse had significantly larger stress-induced increases in inflammation compared to people reporting less severe grief symptoms after the death of their spouse. This study adds to the broader literature to show that the prolonged experience of strong negative emotions, in this case grief, can influence immune responses to stress. It's also important to consider that this is just looking at one stressor in isolation, right? But we face so many stressors as humans, especially navigating this social world. So because of this, this increase in inflammation may be happening in response to stressors that occur multiple times per day even, which is why we think this pathway from grief symptom severity to increased spikes in inflammation may partially help to explain the widowhood effect. And if you have any questions or just want to know more about how we did any part of this research, please feel free to leave a comment so I know which pieces to talk more about because I'd love to share. <laughs> all right, y'all, that's all for today. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, you can like, comment, and share with your friends for more videos like this.